Anne, it's me. I'm calling from Vienna and I... Oh, I'm sorry. Calling from Prague. Prague? Prague. I'm pretty sure it's Prague. Anyway, Anne, I wanted to apologise. I realised how much I hurt you, my sweet, sweet darling, and I just... Oh, look, look, there's someone on the other line, Anne, and I really, really... Oh, I'm sorry. I really have to take this call. I'll get back to you.
young and beautiful, naturally. The man. Older, troubled, sensitive, naturally. Yes, a naturally <coughs> sensitive man, but nevertheless a man of power and authority. <laughs> Who knows that this is wrong? They both know this is wrong. They both know this is wrong, but they can't help themselves. They're making love in the man of power. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> what? <laughs> making love. Making love. In the man's apartment, a luxury apartment, naturally, with a view of the entire city. These are the basic ingredients. A panorama over the entire city. The charming geometry of the, the rooftops, the skylights, the quaint chimneys. Mm. Let's say he grunts. <laughs> yes, yes, let's say he grunts, but sensitively. The man <laughs> of power and authority, he grunts. But it's not, for example, the low, coarse, pig-like grunt of a <laughs> in a confined space, trying to loosen a cross-threaded nut with a heavy and appropriately sized Absolutely wrench. Not, but the masterful grunt of a man who has breakfast on one continent and lunches on another, who flies first class with a linen napkin and a comprehensive wine list. That kind of man? That kind of grunt. That kind of light. Mm. These are the essential ingredients. Oh, but now a look crosses her face. A what? A look. A doubt. A look of doubt, yes, good. Even now. Even, even now, in the intensity of her passion. Even now, in the intensity of her passion. Look how yeah. shadow crosses her, her face. That's premonitory shadow. <laughs> premonitory? A premonitory shadow. Is that a word? Is what word? <laughs> <laughs> of course, premonitory is a word. Later. Night. Strings of light, suspended starlight along the keys oh, and the oh, frameworks oh. of bridges. <laughs> The man telephoned, his lowered voice, his <laughs> troubled glances. 3 a.m. Anne wakes up. His voice appears in doorway. Dialogue. Who is it? She says. <laughs> Nothing, he says. Who the fuck is it? She says. End of dialogue. And now she's angry. <laughs> exactly. End of dialogue. And now she's angry because she knows exactly who it is. His political masters calling him. That's right, his political masters calling him. Just as they have always called the very political masters that she hates with every fibre, as it were, as of her being. Mm. The very men and women <coughs> that she and her youthful idealism hold responsible for the terminal injustice of the world. The leaders who have destroyed everything she values in the name of A, business, and B, laissez-faire. Oh. In the name of A, rationalisation, and B, of enterprise. In the name of A, so-called individualism, and of B, so-called choice. Mm. The basic ingredients, in other words, the whole tragedy. The whole tragedy, exactly, mm. unfolds before our eyes in Paris, Prague, Venice, mm. Berlin, to name but four, as the moon, <laughs> vast and orange, rises over railway stations and modernist slabs of oh. suburban housing, exemplifying the dictum, form follows function. Well, a whole tragedy, in other words, of love. This whole tragedy of ideology and love. She begins to... Shout! She begins to beat him with her fists. She begins to bite him with her teeth. Oh, she begins to kick him with her bare white teeth. She feet. beats and beats. Until she stops for breath. Let's say, shall we, that she at this point, finally, <laughs> stops for breath. The woman, oh yes, stops for breath. Mm. And he, uh, bow, bow, bows his head. Looks up at her. Yes. Takes her tit stained face between his hands. Like a precious chalice. Or a rugby ball. Yeah, like a precious <laughs> silver chalice. Or, as you say, like a rugby football before a chocolate. No. <laughs> he takes her angry, tear stained face between his hands. He still loves her. For all their ideological differences, that's right, he still loves her. Our oh, speech. Oh, One day, Anne, he says. You will understand my world. One day and you will understand that everything must be paid for, that even your ideals must be paid for, end of speech. At which point he <laughs> wet strands of hair from her lips and kisses her. These are the basic ingredients. Uh, he kisses her and pushes her back down onto the bed. Or she, him. Better still, she pushes him back down onto the bed, such as her emotional confusion, such as her <laughs> sexual frustration, such as her inability to distinguish between right and wrong in this great consuming Fashion marks all tragedy, in other words, of love. A great, exactly, tragedy of ideology and love. These are the basic ingredients.
all of the parts is there in her face. It's written there like a, a history. The history of her family, the, the history of the land, this land where her family has lived for generations. It's a valley. It's a valley, yes, deep in the hills. Oh, it's a valley deep in the hills where the traditional ways have been maintained for generations. And there are fruit trees. Each child <laughs> who is born in this valley has a fruit tree planted in their name. In fact, there's a kind of ceremony. Formal, oh, exactly. A formal ceremony. kind of ceremony takes place in the village, and, and generation upon generation, this ceremony of naming is taking place on birth of each child. In other words, the trees have names? The, the trees have names, yes. just as the inhabitants have names. And if there's the person, there's their tree. There's Anya, the woman, and there, Anya, the tree. The trees have names because life is so precious, mm -hmm. so sacred, things are so alive, so felt, it's, it's something we can hardly comprehend. We can hardly comprehend this sacred, sacred life. This sense of completeness is beyond our understanding. And this sense of awe humbles us. But now, devastation. What? Devastation. The harmony of generations has been destroyed. The women have been raped. The little children have been disemboweled. The men have hacked each other's brother has killed brother. The cousin has murdered cousin. And now the dogs are picking over the remains. Yes. The petrol used to fuel the ancient tractors and generate electricity for the black and white TVs has been used to set people alight. Living people set on fire. The cold rush of the vapour, the petrol vapour, and then, and then the hot flame, burning people running between the fruit trees, which, which bear their names, scorching the leaves, writhing around on the grass, and the soldiers stand by, and they're laughing. The soldiers are laughing, even though these are their own cousins, their own parents, their own mothers and fathers. Burning their own parents by the sacred orchard, burning them alive and, and laughing, or burying them alive up to their necks in the fertile earth and then smashing their skulls open with a spade. And it is all there in her face. It's what? It's all there, all there in Anne's face. We don't need words, we're beyond words. The inadequacy of words. The terrifying, yes, inadequacy of words as she stands beside a tree covered in delicate white petals. A plum tree covered in delicate white petals, which, which is the moment we realise. Yes. The moment we realise that this is her tree. This is her tree. Anya's tree. Anya's tree, planted what, 40? 50 years ago on the day of her birth, the hole dug by her father, the roots spread out by her mother, the and water too, and tended to by a family who now lie dead. The air, the air still smells of petrol. Spring. This, this whole valley, deep in spring. The bridge breaks down. Now, now, she breaks down and, and speaks. Yes, because she must. The, the tree gives her strength, the strength to, to speak. She, she points to some child timbers. That, she says, was my home. My children were hiding under the bed and they killed them both. First the boy, then the girl. They set light to my little girl's hair. I still don't know why they set light to my little girl's hair. It just, it crackled like a pipe of sticks. Her eyes blaze. Oh, I think she advances towards the, the camera and begins to curse. You mother fucking shit faced murderers, she says. You pig fucking cock sucking bastards. You, you sister fucking blasphemy, child murdering, mindless fuck face killers. Ah, I spit on your graves and the graves of your mothers, and the graves of your fathers, and, and, and curse all future generations. She's angry. Everything's destroyed. <laughs> a way of life is destroyed, a relationship with nature is destroyed. Why <coughs> sympathize? Not just sympathize, but, but empathize. And empathize because, yes, because Anya's valley is our valley. And this 
trees, the archers, and his family is the family to which we all belong. So it's a universal it's thing. It's a universal obviously. thing in which we strangely which we strangely recognize ourselves. <coughs> It's our own anger, our own world, our own pain. It's a universal thing in which strangely restores. Which strangely restores. I think it does. Yes. Which strangely restores our faith in ourselves. The camera loves you. The camera loves you. The camera loves you. We need to sympathize. We need to <coughs> empathize. We need to realize. We need to advertise. We are the good guys. We are the good guys. We need to feel what we're seeing is real. It isn't just acting. It's much more exacting than acting. We're talking humanity. We're talking reality. We're talking a plan to be overwhelmed by the utterly believable three-dimensionality, three-dimensionality of all the things that Anne can be, of all the things that Anne can be. A megastar. Hmm? A megastar. The camera loves you. The camera loves you. The camera loves you. We need to go for the sexiest scenario. It isn't just writing. It's much more exciting than writing. Hmm? We're talking humanity. We're talking contemporary. We're talking plan to be overwhelmed. Yes, overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of all the things that Anne could be. All the things that Anne can be. A megastar. The camera loves you. The camera loves you. The camera loves you. The camera. The camera. The camera. The camera. The camera. The camera loves you. forcing her to do anything. Of course you think that. The idea of Annie, little Annie, being forced to do something is, is quite frankly ludicrous. She looks Europe with that big red bag. Europe. 
Africa, South America, you name Chile, it. Brazil. Brazil, Romania, Nigeria. The foothills of the Alps. Always in some foothills with those, that big red bag of that. Because let's face it, she is concerned. Well, of course, she's concerned. We can see that she's concerned. What if not? And this is perhaps how it differs from those previous attempts. What if it's not? Is it cry for help? It's quite clear her mind's made up. No one could help her. Not her mum. Not her dad. Certainly none of her so called friends. She wouldn't have wanted help. Help is the last thing she would have wanted. She enjoys spending lots of time with guests. She gets a feeling of great satisfaction. Yes, she does. Yeah, 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 yes, she says that she enjoys lots of hugs at the station when she has to go home and just on holiday papers. Waving and calling her, see you next time, from the train window. Some of the things she says. <laughs> Some of the strange things she says. I feel like a screen. I feel like a screen. <laughs> oh, she's lying there, isn't she? With a tube in her poor thin arm, looking terribly pale, lighter and fatter than the pillow. I feel like a screen, where in the front everything is real and alive, but round the back it's just dust and a few flies. You know, dust and a few wires, her imagination. Oh, and then she says that she's not a real character, does she? No, she says that she's a, a lack of character, or, or an, an absence of character, an absence of character, as she An absence of character, you know, whatever that means. <laughs> and then, she wants to be a terrorist, doesn't she? Oh, that's right. Uh, she comes out one day to the kitchen with those big, earnest uh, eyes of hers and tells her mum and dad she wants to be a terrorist. Oh, she wants her own gun and her own little room and a list of names. Target. A list, that's right, of so called targets. She wants their photographs. She wants to kill one of we. And it has to be one of Her poor mum and dad are horrified. They absolutely don't know how to take this. <sighs> She'd like to act like a machine. Why don't she? Ah, she'd like to be a machine. Sometimes she would spend days on end pretending to be a television. Or a car. <laughs> a car. Or a television. An automatic pistol. Or a train or sewing. Machine. Stop it. <laughs> a sewing machine. Oh my god, so the things she don't want with. Oh, oh, and then the chop around the world. One minute it's Africa, South America, Europe, somewhere in Europe, Europe, Africa, South America, you name it, Brazil, Cuba, Brazil, Romania, Nigeria, the foothills of the Alps, somewhere in the Alps with that big red bag. And the same hair, don't forget the same long hair down to her waist. Yes, the same hair at 40 as she had at 20, like a young girl in some of those photos. Yeah, even at 40, she still looks and dresses like a young girl half her age. <laughs> What's really conclusive though is a bag.
together in formal and friendly surroundings, allowing them to enjoy holidays together and be a surprise. She has no conscience. She expresses no remorse. She says, I do not recognise your authority. Just what does she mean by that? Who does she think she is? And does she really imagine that she will come to account for the lives that she's destroyed? And does she really imagine that anything can justify her random acts of senseless violence? Nothing in her eyes reveals one spark of human one feeling. One spark, that's right, of human feeling or any sense of shame. I mean, is this the same child? Who, is this the same child who once wore a pink gingham dress and had fancy Barbie and fancy Ken and all the outfits and the tiny, tiny shoes? The house, the horse, and Barbie's very own car. Is this really the same little Anne who put all the tiny, tiny dolls in rows and all the tiny, tiny shoes in rows and all the tiny, tiny bees in rows? And what's more, pray to God each night with no sense whatsoever of irony. God bless Mummy. God bless Sunny. God bless Wee the Cat. God bless everybody with no sense of irony whatsoever, but rather in the sincere belief that she might, there on her knees in her wee mouse pyjamas, invoke the blessing of the Father and the Son and the Holy Amen. Wet the bed each night until her sleepless parents took her to the doctor, who, with his heap of magazines, pulled for a smile down her knickers on a high, cold leather couch to say, Let's take a look at the house, shall we? The same Anne who came home from the hospital with a wooden box containing a bell to go beside the bed, two stiff squares of metal gauze, and an array of black. The same Anne who woke up each subsequent night to the sound of the horrible bells in the horrible wet sheets. Is this the same little Anne who now, what, stands there, stands there in front of serious men and women who refuses to recognise their authority, who stands there in front of witnesses and sealed plastic bags with evidence inside, who refuses to recognise their authority, pieces of human flesh false passports, lists of names, or traces of explosives, tapes of phone calls, and psychiatric reports which confirm A, her intelligence, and B, her sanity. And she set about her work, they say, with all the same terrible detachment of an artist. Witnesses break down in tears. Witnesses break down in tears, as videotapes from banks and shopping malls show Anne as just one more person going about their business under constant surveillance until 20 minutes after she's left, the plate glass blows out of a shoe shop window in absolute silence and the little grey figures flying through the air and blowing apart with the tiny, tiny shoes in absolute silence of real human beings mixed with glass. No one can no, find out what her motive is. Fun. She lives alone. She lives alone. She works alone. She works alone. She Kills her life. She lives, works, sleeps, kills, and eats entirely on her own. Is this really the same little Anne who now has long standing officers of both sexes receiving counselling for the impotence, the amenorrhea, the night sweats, the trembling hands, and, and flashbacks of human heads popping open as if in slow motion, and the long, long, terrible wail of a buried, unreachable child recurring as a kind of. What's the word? An auditory hallucination. Yes, for which they are now demanding to be compensated. The same Anne who woke up to the sound of the horrible bell and watched the shadows of the dark chestnut trees on her bedroom wall in the wet sheets. Who summed up the mood of a generation. Who appeared twice on the cover of both magazines. Who sold the film rights for two and a half million US dollars. Who studied in depth the baggage code procedures and the timetable of the principal international airline. Who was, quote, a loner, unquote who listens expressionlessly, unquote, to the description of, quote, outrage, unquote, after, quote, outrage, unquote, after, quote, outrage, unquote, she has perpetrated. Driving away from the bombed out city in the metallic red Cadillac circa 1956. Name! 
when she reaches a checkpoint lit by burning tyres and is asked exactly for her name. Strangely! Strangely enough, she doesn't reply to this reasonable request, but instead begins a tirade of foul mouth abuse. You motherfucking shit faced murderers! You pink fucking cock sucking bastards! You sister fucking blaspheming child murdering mindless fuck face killers! Language! I shit on your graves and on the graves of your mothers and fathers! Identity! And curse on future generations! And then when asked once more, that's right, and her identity falls silence. Silence! What? What? She mumbling something about her garden and the plum trees and the city's dried up fountains. She's mumbling something Speak about up! She's mumbling something about that's right. Speak up, you bitch! She's mumbling something about loss of electricity, nights but in complete darkness, the decay of frozen meat. Oh, and women in the street banging saucepans. Nice! Oh, and the burning of entire lives full of books, and of stale bread being thrown off the back of trucks, and on and on about her garden and the white flowers. Meanwhile! The smell of sewage, coffee, and human remains, and meanwhile, that's right, thank you. Meanwhile, the soldiers crowd around this nameless woman with long grey hair streaked with blood, and around a red meta metallic Cadillac lit by stacks of burning tires, and ask her, just where the fuck? Where the fuck on this god fucking sacred night does she think she's going? What? What? The airport. Speak up! The airport. I'm going to the airport. You don't have to shout at me. I'm an educated woman with a passport and a bank account in US dollars. And I'm taking my child to the airport. Strangely. Please let me pass. But yes, strangely, as you say, that there seems to be no child. The child? What child? And women with passports don't look like this, and women with US dollars don't look like this. They get their hair streaked professionally in a salon with artificial highlights, not with human blood. Child! What child? Just what exactly does she mean by child? This nameless woman with long grey hair. And while we're on the subject of her appearance, why can't she be a cat? Why can't she be more sympathetic? Why can't she have a why can't she bend over and let us see her ass? You know? Why can't she break down in tears and make us long to comfort her instead of staring like that and spitting? Strangely! So what? Yes, yeah, sorry, strangely, as you say, the light from the torch reels on the back seat of the vehicle, two shiny plastic bags, each tied with neck. No child whatsoever. Child? What child? And then she's mumbling something about. Speak her. up! She's mumbling something about her little girl, her little Anne, her little Anushka. She's mumbling something about speak up. She's mumbling something about her little Anushka being in the bags and her need, her urgent need to take these bags to the airport with her education and her bank account in US dollars and buy air tickets. Doesn't she realise the airport is closed? Didn't she hear the runways being bombed? Strangely! Strangely can't she feel the burning white heat of the aviation fuel? No! Strangely, as you say, she seems to believe the airport is functioning normally. Strangely! And strangely, this nameless woman seems to imagine that she can still operate a bank account with a plastic card and fly first class with a little ass with a mishka out of the way of rifles and axes. Strangely! But yeah, strangely, no one asks her what she means by Anushka being in the bags. Strange! And yet, strangely, no one asks to examine the bags. Strangely! And yet, perhaps most strangely of all, no one questions why a child should be in two bags as opposed to one. Strangely! Get out of here, get out of my life. Let's finish this. You guys are good. Except the Nolikos. I wish the Nolikos not to. Let's get out of here. 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 Tik yra labai svarbu suprasti, kad jį kontroliuoja. Net tada, kai tai atrodo žiauriai ir pavojingai. O taip nėra, be abejo. Žinoma,
decimos los pueblos. That's all. For the time being, thank you. 